Okay, so now I can announce my co-moderator, and she changed much. the title of her talk. It's not bridging therapy, we already heard a presentation about that theme, but she will talk how to save time, because time matters so very much in a huge circle. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yes, we changed the type, title um, to, to not have two similar topics in here. Um, I think especially, um, first of all, thank you so much for again organizing this meeting. It's an absolute honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I think this is one of the most important meetings because we really have the possibility to learn from each other, from the different uh, specialities. There are very few meetings like this. And um, I thought, uh, uh, as we're all together, it would be good to also share our experience on how we can save time, because we know time is brain, um, and work together as a team. And um, I have recently just changed my um, uh, post. I've, we're now setting up a stroke thrombectomy service in Scotland, where there are also quite big distances. So patients are coming from as far as the Shetland Islands. They're flown over. Thank you very much. Just to have an impression on the center. Thank you very much. So what is different in our setups is that, for example, the last center that we set up was done in a pure cardiology center. So it was not the typical neuroradiologists that are performing the procedure, but we did that together by teaching our um, interventional cardiology team how to perform thrombectomies. Um, and set up the service. Here now we're doing it um, in a team of interventional radiologists um, where there was previously no neuroradiological service available. Um, I do have a conflict, uh, these are my disclosures, and the most relevant um, conflict of interest is that I'm co-founder of Brainomics, an AI, AI company that automatically detects stroke and is a decision guidance tool, which I will mention in here. Um, now, if we look at the pathway, so basically every hospital, whether they have a thrombectomy service or not, will have, the patients will have to follow this pathway. And what we need to look at is whether in, where in each step we can save time. Now, if we start with the pre-hospital phase here, so we have pre-hospital phase, patient has to be evaluated, we need the imaging, primary treatment, thrombectomy, and then also rehabilitation, supportive treatment, intensive care unit, blood pressure management. Now, um, in the pre-hospital phase, you can already save a lot of time. If you're setting up a service, consider already contact with the paramedics so that they pre-alert you. So what we have done is our, pra our paramedics will pre-alert. They have a decked phone, not a decked phone because we don't have good network coverage everywhere. They will reach the stroke physician and the stroke physician will ask and they say, we think it is a stroke. And if they think this patient is a stroke, um, we will ask them a, a score, which is the LAM score, Los Angeles Motor Score, which is a very simple score which you can do over the phone. We've just introduced that score, um, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, just been published in the whole of the federal state of the Saarland with all paramedics, and we found a 70% sensitivity and specificity for detecting large vessel occlusions. So very important not for detecting stroke, not like with the FAST score, for large vessel occlusion. 
So first of all, um, there's this pre-screening by the paramedics, and we are now, um, as in uh, next thing in November, hoping that we'll also start with video conferencing with a dedicated um, uh, software um, uh, stroke communication tool where we can immediately see the patient do the examination as well. Um, this has shown in uh, previous publications to significantly reduce door-to-needle times. And um, the advantage is that here also the whole um, stroke team will immediately see where the patient is. They can contact, they can see on the map, for example, where the patient is moving, when will they arrive in the hospital. And you can also combine it with the images so that all the relevant information is inside. So um, with Pulsara, for example, you can also take screenshots of it. You can also put the um, contact details of a patient in if it's about consenting, getting more information. And you have different layers where you can get, okay, now it's confirmed it's a large vessel occlusion, now we get the thrombectomy team involved. So you have different layers. Also with us, we immediately get the result of the COVID test because up to now we have to treat everyone as COVID positive and it's quite uh, good to know, know the patient has not been tested positive and we don't need to don. Um, Another um, uh, a part what we do is the moment um, uh, the patient comes um, is considered a stroke, we bypass A&E. And actually it has been shown that you can save the most times by bypassing these patients and do not let them go via A&E. So these patients are directed directly to the CT scanner. The CT team is pre-alerted and they are met at the scanner by the stroke team. Only the stroke patients or those that we think are stroke. If the NIHS score is high, then automatically we have a pre-alert to the interventional team and to the um, anesthetist. The anesthetist will in the meantime see if there would be a bed available. You have a possibility with the NIHSS uh, score to sort of triage how many patients you will have to cope with. The higher you put the score, the more likely it is that this is a large vessel occlusion patient. So if you have a score of 10 out of four patients, only one will have a large vessel occlusion. If you have a score of 20 out of four patients, three of them will have a large vessel occlusion. So you can choose more or less yourself whether you have how many false alerts you have. We have chosen a score at the moment of 10. And um, once we get more into it, we will reduce the score to six and that will then automatically already trigger the alert um, to the anesthetist and to the interventional team, and also the preparations in the cath lab, and we get phone back, say there's this patient on the table right now, it's going to take this time, or we need to move to a different angio, and um, the team um, is already in alert to then be stood down in case the CT angio shows there is no large vessel occlusion. Point of care laboratories, blood examinations at the CT scanner, at the, uh, at the place of imaging have been shown to half door to therapy times in acute stroke in a study by Professor Silke Walter from the Saarland. And um, now the next question is, what about artificial intelligence? How can that um, help us in the image interpretation? Now, um, bear in mind that in our service, um, we now have sev several small hospitals where you will not have a neuroradiologist available, you will probably not even have a radiologist available all the time. So the question is, how do you find those patients, which are the patients to be transferred to the thrombectomy site, without having to be called for each patient and without having to then dial in, look at the images or do um, the decision? So um, this is where artificial intelligence software can help. Um, uh, there are some reports that it also reduces the door to groin puncture time here, a report from um, uh, the University Hospital in Lübeck in the north of Germany, or um, Semmelweis University in Budapest um, have introduced the software, and uh, they also found higher rates of uh, thrombolysis, of thrombectomy, and uh, shorter times. But I think the main advantage here for the software is that you have a standardized reporting um, of how much damage there already is on the brain. And I have moved completely away from a time window. When I'm asking about the patient, I do not even ask when was the onset of the stroke. I don't care. 
because I've had patients who've come to me after one hour, they have no collaterals, there was already no brain left in these patients, then there are patients after six hours, and there is still all the brain left because they have good collaterals. So I think the concept of the time window is out. We are now going towards our physiological time window, a brain um, window, and it's about the individual patient. I do think that the structured reporting helps us because very often you will find that if you see something, you think, okay, everything is affected, so you tend to overreact um, or you miss it. The structure forces you to look at the different areas in a structured way. Now, um, again, in the middle of the night, um, I'm not very good at looking at those images saying, what is this? I want the software. And I'm, uh, uh, when um, the physicians call me, and in order to survive um, uh, such a big service, because, yeah, there are quite a few patients that will come and quite a few requests, usually you will find in centers that are not used to thrombectomy that you have nine requests for one thrombectomy. And with training, you will get down to three or four requests to one real case. So it's not the 50 cases you'll have to deal with from a center, it's the 500 requests that you have to deal with. And with that, a software is very helpful. So in my previous center, we set the threshold, and I said, if the aspect score is below six, I do not want to see the patient, except if the patient is really young and there's a different situation. If the patient has no collaterals, I do not want to see the patient and that is because the transfer time was so long that I knew those patients would it, wouldn't make it. In our center, different scenario because we can start straight away. Um, the other thing is the detection of the vessel occlusion. Um, <clears throat> that, uh, I think, is uh, very important because getting someone to interpret the CT angios, especially out of hours, sometimes it needs bringing someone in to do a CT angio during the night, um, so um, there it helps as well. And um, what we have now uh, done is um, we have started looking at the hyperdense vessel, and this is now for the first time that the software can already do it. Um, and we would accept a patient to come on the basis of a hyperdense vessel identified here um, as a very likely case for an occlusion. Now, perfusion images. You will have heard um, that very often it's CT, CT angio, CT perfusion. We used to do the same, we've stopped doing it. So, um, whereas most centers with the dawn study and the extended time window have now started all adding perfusion, we've gone exactly the opposite way. Why? I'm still interested in the core infarct volume, but we can see the core infarct volume on the plain CT. Now, when you look at the dawn study, that also made the decision based on the core infarct volume, which was derived by the perfusion images. So if I can get that volume without needing a perfusion, I prefer that option. And um, there is also a big study that was done at uh, Emory University where they look at the ischemic core volume. They looked at 479 patients um, that were all completely recanalized to TIMI 2 co 3 and they um, compared it at the time to the RAPID software that was also used in the DAWN study to see is there a difference in the patients if we choose them from plain CT or if we choose them from perfusion CT, and um, there was no difference. Um, you could estimate the ischemic score volumes with a similar performance than in the CT perfusion. Here's an example, so it then shows you where the, infa the core infarct volume is, counts it together, and that is what I based my decision on, not just the infarct volume, but also the location where, it, where the... Um, deficit is, where the dead area is. Now, benefit can be faster, um, less radiation, and I can always repeat a perfusion scan either in our center or even on the angio um, doing a DINA imaging. Trombectomy, is there any time we can save in trombectomy? Here, you may have heard me talk about um, simulators before. Um, the simulators have now completely changed um, from being expensive toys to 
um, real medical devices where you can put patient data, CT angio, onto the simulator, you can practice the procedure, um, you have the same haptic feedback, you can do different devices, you can change the angulations. It's the perfect place to do team training with your team so that everyone understands their role. It's also a perfect rehearsal for learning um, the different steps of a procedure, but unfortunately you cannot inject do any injections, you cannot use all the real devices. Um, and the flushing is a main part of the training in thrombectomy. And that, I have to say, is the main reason why I decided to move to Scotland, um, because what um, they have developed there is a teal cadaveric model. So what you're seeing here is a human cadaver. It is the only place in the world where they have found a way of embalming the bodies, um, they are put into a special solution for over a year, which gets all the vessels, the blood out of the vessels, so the vessels are open. The cadavers are not stiff. Yeah, you have um, the whole range of movement. Um, uh, we've just used it for um, placing a new heart valve, so you can even see the valves um, uh, moving. And it is, in my opinion, the most realistic way that we currently have on the market for, for doing and practicing actual um, procedures in here. You can use the real devices, you can do coiling of aneurysms, you can do thrombectomies, you can place intracranial stents, you can use the same flushing, the same devices, and that can give you the real experience before going there. So do we really need to learn on a patient? We cannot plan the procedure. No, um, is this the future? I believe this is the, the future for learning different kinds of procedures um, in the real patient, um, and um, the first patients they gave me were two 98-year-old patients. It even works in a 98-year-old. It was as challenging. You can have the same complications as we could have with perforations, um, with dissections. The same things can happen, um, uh, but, uh, and you can sort of choose for courses. We'd usually then take a younger patient. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm, uh, one has to see it to realize what, cap what it is capable of. The other thing that I think is very useful is having occasional team trainings, um, where, for example, you can also film the team, where you see how everyone is reacting. It is just a refresher, where you then later on analyze what was done on the team, because in the procedure, everyone thinks, yes, we're doing the right thing. Um, after the procedure, everything is forgotten. You were so pleased how the patient is, you're worried about the patient. When you then go through the film, there are a lot of things where you can save, shave off time. Um, other thing um, is the one-stop shop. Uh, these images are courtesy to uh, Siemens. It is the possibility of doing a CT, um, a CT angio, and also a CT perfusion um, on the angio, on the angiographic table um, itself. Um, very, very useful if you need um, uh, to see how long do we continue. Difficult procedure, patient is already in a late time when they arrived with us. You don't know how long to continue. Learning how to stop, also very challenging. Um, perfusion scan, how much brain are we still fighting for? How much is dead? Helps you very much in the decision. You can also see if there are some areas that are at risk of hyperperfusion injury that will change your blood pressure management. Here you can see how good the images have become, conventional CT versus the Dyna CT. Um, so big difference here. Continuous auditing of times, absolutely essential. And um, then the ultimate thing, of course, for saving time, the mobile stroke ambulance, um, originally invented by Professor Fassbender in Germany. Um, here, this is our UK mobile stroke ambulance inside a CT scanner with point of care laboratory inside, of course, with artificial intelligence. So I'm not on the ambulance anymore. I've taken myself off. We have telemedicine and um, the software to do the analysis. Um, so the ambulance um, can now run um, paramedic led. We still have a doctor on there, um, but um, that uh, uh, is, of course, for triaging of patients, especially now um, that there's also dwindling evidence for IV thrombolysis first. It is a way of selecting patients to bypass a center that is not thrombectomy capable and going directly to the thrombectomy capable center. There is sound with it. Never mind. <laughs>
Thank you very much. And with this, I end my presentation. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments? So you, you have teached everybody how to behave, to be yeah. fast enough <laughs> you know, to it's, rescue it, brain cells. It's yeah. a shaving off minute by minute, yeah. and um, <clears throat> with um, and especially those simulated sessions. Trick is you need to move away from the hospital. It is not possible to do those training sessions in the hospital because someone is always bleeped. Yeah, you have to get away. Um, another trick is to change roles. Let um, your cath lab nurse take over the role of the operator and vice versa, to then critically question why each step of the procedure is done. So, for example, we do all, um, uh, not all, but most of the procedures under general anesthesia, mainly also because we've got a new team. We want the best working environment um, for this with a patient that is not moving. Um, and um, I think it also speeds up the actual intervention and um, time to intubate the patient. Or Actually, the time we're aiming for is eight minutes from CT to arterial puncture. That means working in parallel. So the patient is intubated in a fast, rapid intubation technique, no fluffing around, no arterial line. Yeah, just put the tubes in. Blood pressure um, of the patient pushed up if it's not too high, otherwise not lowered. And then immediately, whilst the patient, whilst they're still preparing the patient and the access, we are already preparing the groin, we're preparing the devices to go in in parallel. Um, and uh, so I think what you should aim for, aim for um, 10 minutes from decision to arterial puncture and try and shave off every minute. We are now not managing 10 minutes yet, but hopefully then next year, um, by then, we can improve the progress, take the team away, change roles, and practice the procedure. Good? Yes. Mm -hmm. so. And you can analyze in your uh, hospital all the steps. So uh, we, when we started that many years ago, yes, we documented all the times we needed until the patient was, yes on the table for thrombectomy, yes? And then you can improve it. Why did we need there five minutes or 10 minutes or even more, yes? So and I think don't forget, one minute means nearly two million brain cells <laughs> yeah, which and, will die. And per six minutes delay, the patient has 1% lesser chance of a good outcome. Yeah. So, um, and uh, the patients aren't screaming, there's no blood squirting, so usually People do not see the sense of urgency, so you really need to bring that home. And the communication with the paramedics is crucial. And um, I think it will become even more important, I don't know if the um, ERASER study that looked at bypassing centers in uh, Catalonia has already been published, but um, again, um, it seems that patients who were directly trans, because our fear was always are we withholding thrombolysis from patients who may not have a large stroke when we go directly to a thrombectomy-capable center? And um, it seems in that study it was not the case. So with the dwindling evidence for the need for thrombolysis, and especially in those patients that with the scores are considered high risks for a large vessel occlusion, high LAMP score, yeah, high race score, high, yeah, uh, high NIHSS score, in those patients, I think it makes sense bypassing, going to a different center first, getting a CT there, CT angio, getting that interpreted, probably getting thrombolysis. Bypass that center, even if it's two hours journey, come directly to the thrombectomy capable center where the patients could um, get the, um, the therapy. What we also did, we offered from the hospital annually uh, for the normal public outside, yes, an information session, yes, because some of you are certainly cardiologists also, and when you have an acute myocardial infarction, that's much more dramatic clinically, so the people are, yes, reacting spontaneously, whereas when 
somebody is not speaking properly anymore or cannot move his arm, yes, that doesn't look so dramatic, so there is often time lost because uh, also the public does not react, so, so the family members or others, is that a stroke or what is it, or why don't you move, yes, and so I think it's also important to go to the radio, to the TV, to the newspapers and uh, inform the people on a continuous basis. So then no further questions, then I think um, we should go have the coffee break.